uh, Father God, we want to thank you for this morning. <laughs> Woo, I know why we have a lot of people not in choir. Lord, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for this day. Lord, we want to thank you for this opportunity to come and be in your church. For in Christ's name we pray. All God's children say it. There's my Baltimore First Baptist. Folks, let me ask you a question. Last week we looked about um, the hook, line, and sinker and, and what Satan wants to do to us. And today we're going to be looking a little bit about the bait. Now, how many of y'all grew up watching Looney Tunes? I, I grew up watching Looney Tunes. Listen, my girls, who aren't even half my age, grew up watching Looney Tunes, some of the best cartoons in the world, especially with Tom and Jerry. But there is... Um, um, a cartoon that always shows a donkey, donkey, with a stick on its back, and it's got a carrot. And that donkey's constantly trying to get that carrot. See, a lot of people think a bait is something you put on a hook, but hooks come in a lot of different ways, and the bait comes a lot of different ways. And for some odd reason, sometimes Satan has a way of putting a bait in front of us like a carrot to a donkey to get us to go his way and get tunnel vision and, exple and completely expel any sight of God's way he has for our life. Now, I don't want you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many people in here today feel like the donkey chasing the carrot. See, I want you to realize Satan will put that carrot out there in so long, but when you start realizing you're not going to get it, Satan has this masterful way of letting you have the carrot. Why would Satan want to let you have the carrot? Why would he want you to let you have that bait? Because he knows if he can get you to consume that sinful bait in your life. He gives you just a little bit. Then he gives you more and he gives you more. The minute you start realizing it's affecting you, he keeps giving you more bait. Because the hook, as we talked about yesterday or last week, is always in the bait. Folks, you don't have to walk out of here feeling like the world donkey anymore. But you can walk out of here feeling like a saved child of God. But it'll be your choice to decide which one you're going to want. So this morning, I'm going to ask if you'd be willing to stand as we read James 1.19. It'll just be one verse to start with. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Last time I read that, I had a, a bunch of wives say amen. I guess me and y'all were doing a good job. Straight one more time. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Father, let us hear your word this morning. Lord, let it be in our heart. But more importantly, let it be in our actions. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Folks, what does it mean? What does this mean? What does it mean to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? We're going to be looking at that today, and we're going to understand exactly where God would have us to be in this today. We almost re realize that temptation, we talked about this last week. I encourage you to go listen to it if you didn't. But last week, we looked how temptation leads to enticement, and to enticement leads to the sin. This is why we must always be aware of our surroundings, not only the world around us, but also the surroundings and what we place in our minds. Folks, I'm going to give you a saying. When it comes to temptation, it is better to shun the bait than the struggle on the hook. It is better to shun the bait than the struggle on the hook. And I don't know about y'all this morning, but I get tired of struggling on hooks. If I'm going to struggle with anything, the biggest thing I struggle with these days, and, and it happened again this morning, and I ain't trying to be funny, but I like a little creamer in my coffee. The powdered creamer. It's easier to clean up if you get it on the floor. But why in the world do they have to super glue that cellophane top on top? I used to struggle trying to peel that thing off. And my wife, in all her wisdom, she goes, why do you do it that way? I said, what is there another way? She gets a knife and pokes a hole and it gets her finger and pulls it up. That's the reason I married her. She's smart. <laughs> We're struggling. Why do we as Christians always seem to want to struggle? See, 
Last week, we looked at the hooks that lead to either death or life. This week, we're going to be looking further, and we're going to be discussing the baits that are used in our life to determine our destinies. You don't have to struggle anymore, church. Sir, you don't have to struggle. Ma'am, you don't have to struggle. Team, you don't have to struggle. If you're struggling, you're choosing to struggle because we only struggle when we're not willing to give the struggle, the hardship, the burden of that struggle to Christ. And we say, Christ, I want you to handle this burdensome struggle and I'm just going to walk in your glory and see what your answer is. Some of us have gotten so used to holding on to the struggles of life, we don't know any other way. And when we see glory coming, We'll shun it because we're afraid what glory is going to get us because we've gotten used to the struggle. Those baits can lead to life or death. This morning we're going to be looking at the physical baits. See, physical baits in our life have a certain way of enticing us. They have a certain way of making sure that we can get in what we want physically but not necessarily spiritually. The first thing we saw in the verse, it says we must be quick to hear. So when we hear something and we know it's from God, we need to be quick to hear it. But for many of us, or many of the sound of my voice this morning, quick to hear sometimes mean quick to hear anything that we think is going to give us relief, even though we know it's not from God. Proverbs 18, 13 says, if anyone gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and a shame. Now, I'm not going to bring up family members, but y'all have heard me talk about one of my uncles. I ain't going to say his name. He might actually listen to one of my sermons someday. But have you ever met someone that can give you an answer before you ever ask the question because they just know everything? How can we give an answer if we don't know the full scope of the question or the full knowledge or the depth that the question entails? See, God is very good to let us know when he says if anyone gives us folly it's a joke don't listen to someone if they don't know what they're talking about we are expected to live in a certain way we're expected to shine in a certain way we're expected to make sure that when we give an answer we're full aware of the question that was posed this morning What answers do you give to God before you ever understand the mission he's given you? I would like to ask you, sir, to go. I can't go. Father God looks at you. I want you to. I I ain't got time. Every one of us this morning, God's saying, don't be so quick. Listen to what I'm asking you, but let it not just sink in your mind, but let your heart feel it. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own ways, but a wise man listens to advice. Every one of us are going to have an opinion. I promise you as a pastor, I get more opinions than probably the uh, President of the United States because he can turn his radio and TV off. Y'all don't know where I live. And I don't have a gate with National Guard around my house. And you're always going to be greeted with a smile. If it's nice outside, I'm going to invite you to sit on the front porch and pour you a nice cup of sweet southern iced tea. Because if it don't have sugar in it, it ain't tea, it's just dirty water. I know I get some amens from that. Folks, what does it mean when it says the right way in his own eyes? Our eyes are owned by Christ. Our hearts are owned by Christ. Our lives are owned by Christ. We don't have the right answer. That's the reason God gave us this beautiful love letter in front of me right now. And his answer is there. It's full. It's continuous. It's ever living and it's everlasting. This is the reason we must be quick to hear not only what the world is trying to tell us before we give an answer, but also quick to hear God's word and let us be advised on how and get the wisdom from it. And then we're called to be slow to speak. Now, that's going to be hard for people who are sarcastic. And we're in the South. There's a lot of us. My wife, T, 
tells many people, my husband's got the most wittiest, quickest, sarcastic wit there is out there. You would think that would be a compliment. But she's learned to live with it. But when God's word tells us to be slow to speak, it means we need to understand the question. Sometimes we'll just say something and we don't understand the reason behind it. This morning I was a little late, but I understand the process and the importance of coming into God's house groomed and shaved. Close to the skin, ain't that right, Pastor Jeremy? Nobody likes that dirty stubble. <laughs> but we must realize what it means when God's Word tells us to be slow to speak. You know, we've been giving updates on missions. We've got a couple more weeks to go when we're going to have some updates. But I love what Pastor Jeremy said this morning. We all have opinions about California. And we had conversations before he went, and he had opinions about California, and I had opinions about California, and both our companions coincided with one another. And then he came back and told me what he saw, and his opinion changed my opinion. That's the reason we're going to take mission trips to California, because they need Jesus too. Here's the interesting thing about California and people there. They know they're lost, and when they find Jesus, they know they need Jesus. Here in the state of South Carolina, everybody thinks they're born into heaven. And they don't know they need Jesus. It's a beautiful mission field. Sometimes we need to make sure that we understand what God is trying to tell us and be slow to speak. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And whoever and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding cool spirit, not me and me, and hey, you're cool, but cool under tolerance and the temperance that God has already placed in your life saying, let's think this through. Let's think this out. Now, sometimes there's going to be an answer that you know God instantaneously gives you. There's going to be times in your life where you know, hey, I need to help and I need to help right now. There was not a consideration or there was not a hesitation in this church. I'd already decided what I knew God wanted us to do for Haygood, but yet I had a plethora of praise God of members calling me and saying, Pastor, isn't there something we can do? Can they join us? Can we let them use our church? Can we let them use the merge? Can we help them? Absolutely. We didn't have to pray about that. Those are our church family. Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if there's a need known, there's an opportunity given. So it was very easy to speak up. But just as easy as it is to build someone up, we must always make sure we don't use our words to tear people down. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corruption talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We are here to build each other up. Now, I'm going to go through quickly on this, but I want to ask you a question. Have you used your words this week to build anybody up? Men, you have every opportunity every morning when you get up to build your wife up. Women, you have every opportunity when you get up every morning to build your husband up. Parents, you have every opportunity when you get up to build your children up, to build your grandchildren up, to build your co-workers up, to build your classmates up. You have the opportunity to be a builder or to destroy the lives of others with the simple words that come out of your mouth. And we weren't put here to be mouths of corruption. We were put here to be a song of praise. So I ask you again before I go any further, have your words encouraged others this week? Now, there is nothing wrong with encouraging yourself as well. Because I want you to hear one great thing today. You're not near as bad as you think you are. And it's okay to get up in the morning and look at yourself and say, God loves you. And it's going to be okay. Because if we're not, we're going to get angry. We'll get angry at ourselves. We'll get angry at our family. We'll get angry at our life. And we must be slow to anger. 
Proverbs 12, uh, 16, 32 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit, he who takes the city. Be slow to anger. Now, now God is slow to anger. Now, he can get angry. He's getting slow to anger right now. There's a judgment coming. And that judgment's going to be because people have sinned against him. But right now, for those who are in Christ, those who are saved, he is slow to anger and fast to forgive as long as we remember the one key ingredient of that, which means to repent. And if God can do these things for us, we are expected to do it for others. And then we have our spiritual bait. Look at verse number 20. It says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So in our anger, we cannot be righteous. But through God's grace, he makes us righteous because we are the children of God. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. we got to get rid of these youthful passions. I had a 1984 Chevrolet Camaro, only Chevy I've ever had. It was a good-looking thing. Big old wheels, you've heard me tell you in the past, on the back. Cool redneck louvers on the back. T-tops, $4,000 stereo system. I put everything in that motor I could. I bet I had $20,000 in that car, and I was happy to sell it for $1,500. I spent more money, more time on a car than I did the next 10 years in giving to God and my time, my talents, and my tithe to the church. There wasn't much of spirit in me. There wasn't much righteousness in me, not like it should have been. But see, there has to come a time when we give the youthful passions away and we start looking for the mature, righteous passion that God has placed in each and every one of our hearts. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.20 says, So flee youthful passions. He also goes in verse, chapter 6, verse 11, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. I love this saying, and I know it's a southern term, and we find some hint of it in the Bible, but flee from even the appearance of sin. Well, if we're fleeing from the appearance of sin, what are we fleeing to? To the holiness of God. There is only one strong tower that can allow us to escape the youthful passions and desires of the flesh that makes us mature Christians that God has called us to be. This is the reason Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Your verse may say, given to you. But God says when we seek his righteousness, he's going to add things to us. What is God wanting to add to you? I don't know. For each one of us, we have different spiritual gifts he wants to give. For some of you, it's singing. I did not get that spiritual gift. For some of us, it's being able to tower over others and see over their heads. I did not get that spiritual gift. And you're thinking, well, being tall is not a spiritual gift. People see tall people. But sometimes your height is not a physical thing as much as it is a spiritual thing. And people recognize others who have a height and awareness of a God working inside of them. Every one of us in this room today has a spiritual gift. Every one of us, God has placed inside of us, and it's a bait that our body hungers for. It longs for. It wants to have this spiritual gift to be exposed and to be used for God. He put it in there. The Holy Spirit made it and realized it that we could be aware of this spiritual gift and we could use this spiritual gift that others would see it and want to partake of it. And then now our spiritual gift has become a bait for the lost and the lost want to have what we've got. So why are we not casting it out there? Why are we not using God's hooks of the spiritual gifts of love, forgiveness? Why are we not allowing ourselves to be a part of his glory? 
See, if we're not being a glory spiritual gift from God, then what kind of bait are we? We'll, let's look at Ephesians 5, 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of the place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. What does this mean? It means we are supposed to be uh, pure. It means we're supposed to be holy. We have a spiritual gift. We're not stinky. Stink baits made for catfish. Folks, look at verse number 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Now, if you look at this picture right here, that's a little plastic tub. And it looks like barbecue until you open it. Now, when you open it and you go, you're going to realize it is not barbecue. How many of y'all been catfishing at Santee? Can someone just yell out what this is? Stink bait. Why is it a woman answered first? <laughs> I just love you already. It is called stink bait. They had to sit there for a long time to figure out what they were going to call it. Because it stinks to high heaven. If you get it on your fingers or any of your clothes, man, you will not get any sugar from your wife for at least two days. It wears off. You don't wash the stink off. It wears off. But you know, here's the amazing thing with sinful stink bait. Sinful stink bait is wretched. But it doesn't wear off. It can be completely washed off in a second when the Holy Spirit is present. But stink bait is some bad stuff. Catches great catfish. Ephesians tells us that we are to not allow foolishness, talk, or crude joking come out of our mouth. And he goes on to tell us the Lord in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So we can either smell good or we can stink. And Satan knows how to get to us. And he has a lot of different baits. And a lot of reasons we fall short is because of physical, mental, and moral temptation. So what are five ways that we fall prey to this? One is a lack of prayer will cause you to succumb and fall into physical temptations. Mark 14, 38 says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of us have used that in our life? Oh, I want to do what God tells me. The spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak. You ever notice how weak the flesh is during the summer? When the lake and the mountains and the beach are calling. Now, I don't have a problem going to lakes about me. I love going to the lake and the mountains. I love taking my wife to the beach. But when we have something that keeps us from God's house every or almost every week, folks, God didn't give that to us. And let me give you an example. I go on vacation every year. I try to at least get one. But there's never been a time that when I went on vacation, since I have been part of God's house, that we did not come together on the Lord's day and either go to a church where we vacation or me as the spiritual leader of my house set my family down and said it's time for church. Nowhere in God's word does it ever say you vacate from the holiness of God's house. And it's not a building. It's the people. We witnessed that last night with over two, 300 people last night coming to prayer service. It was 94 degrees outside. I had gnat spray on me, which apparently is made for gnat caramel. They loved it. <laughs> I had mosquito spray on my legs, which apparently is hot fudge for them because they love that. I had a little fan that my wife said was charged that died 10 minutes into it. And I was leaning against a hot generator. But I want you to know my soul was on cloud nine. Not because I saw hey good people, but because I saw Barnwellian, church, God-fearing people come together to support their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
We cannot succumb and fall into the physical temptations or let physical things of this world keep us from doing what God would call us to do. The second thing, not walking within the Spirit leads to physical temptation. Galatians 5, 16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So if we're walking in the Spirit, our fleshly desires will not be gratified because the Holy Spirit is sitting there saying, listen, I've got something better for you. Remember earlier, God said that he wants to add to our life. I want to add to your life. Walk away from this and I'll give you something that's greater than your physical desires. Not having physical relations with your spouse or not pursuing marriage before physical relations. Folks, that's a lot. That's a sermon in itself. But listen up. Having physical relations is not the point of marriage. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. But we are to show physical, des- to show physical desire is a sign that spouses should have physical relations with their husbands and wives. It's not a carrot in front of the donkey. You figure out which one the donkey is. And I know this is a touchy subject in today's world, but physical relations are not to happen in a relationship until the relationship of marriage has happened before God. And I know there's going to be some people watching. They may never listen to another sermon again. But I want you to hear this. And I'm going to look into this camera while I look into you. Just because you're an older person and you're not in high school, doesn't mean that you can make the decision to have physical relations with anyone outside of marriage because you say, well, I'm an adult now. You were always a child of God long before you'll ever be adult enough to make that decision. You keep your relationships holy and God will keep your relationships through him and righteousness. Tolerating and not fleeing any form of physical temptation will cause you to fall into the grips of sin. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. And finally, five, minimizing the seriousness of physical temptations and pleasure of the flesh negates the blessings of self-control. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 8 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, or or idolaters, or adulterers, nor when you practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Let me read verse number 11 again. And such things were some of you, but you were washed, means you were washed away and all this sin was taken. You were sanctified by the graceness of God. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He pulled you away and he took that out of your life. And yet many of us were happy to be out of the shackles of sin, but we're still clinging to the chains and rattling them and saying, it's not that bad. Well, that's some strong bait. God says we're supposed to be a beautiful thing. Church, as we as God's people are not only to keep ourselves healthy on the outside, but also clean and pleasing to the Lord on the inside. Filthiness is always followed by rottenness, which stinks to high heaven. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are the aroma of Christ God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. I want you to see and focus on this word. We are the aroma of of Christ Jesus. It's a pleasing smell. We see this in the book of uh, Lamentations and the book of Revelation. It says that we are a pleasing smell to God. So before I go any further and I close, I want to ask you this question. Are you a good smelling aroma to God today? Or when he look at you, he goes, whew, that's some stinky bait. So that's a question you got to ask yourself. Because when we cling and search for the eternal bait, God makes us righteous, makes us holy, and makes us forgiven, and he makes us his. Verse 21b says, and receive the meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. See, his bait saves. 
See, when it says it's implanted, it means to fix or set securely or deeply in, to set permanently in the conscious. Matthew Henry has a great quote that says, meekness is calm confidence, settled assurance, and rest of the soul. It is the tranquil stillness of a soul that is at rest in Christ. It is a place of peace. Meekness springs from the heart of humility, radiating the fragrance of Christ. Boy, he always had a great way to put his words. Because God's eternal bait is more than just bait. It's a promise. It transcends all physical. It transcends all mental. And it is the ultimate authority of all eternal. So I close with Matthew 5, 5 and Titus 3, 2. Blessed are the meek, for they that shall inherit the earth. And to speak evil of one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. See, that's what we're doing. We're God's family. And we're going to show courtesy to all God's people. If we're going to be a bait in this community, we're going to be God's heavenly bait. And we're going to be a bait that everybody wants to take a bite of. But we can't do that until first in our hearts as individuals that we have made our stinky bait into a great aroma fragrance. My wife likes to take baths. And for some odd reason, every now and then, I guess she read it in books, I don't know, I don't really like the smell of it. I keep telling her she's going to burn the house down. But she'll go and she'll put candles around the tub, and sometimes they melt and get on the tub. I tried to persuade her not to do it and say, you know, that's kind of like witchery and witchcraft. You're, 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 you're performing sor sorcery. Can't you just go take a shower? She puts these toxins in that tub called salt and fuzzies. And bubblies, and sometimes the bubbles go over into the floor. I'm like, you know, that looks like a witch's cauldron. She said, just let me have my peace. Let me have my peace. It's just candles. They smell kind of good. Now, I'm not going to say I speak from experience, but the bath kind of feels good, too. <laughs> I was exfoliating. Hey, give me a chance. <laughs> Folks, Winky just got it. God's got something great, great, great. And he doesn't want to put those beautiful scents around you as much as he wants to put it in you. Because when that beautiful scent is in each and every one of you, that's when the flames of God lights the candle. And everyone else around you smells Christ in you. What kind of bait are you going to be this morning? If you would, please stand. Let's pray, Father God. As we begin this time of invitation, I pray that if there's anyone here today that would want to just come to an altar and spend some time with you, Father, just let them come. Lord, maybe there's someone here today that just wants to, for the first time, get rid of that Stinky bait. Stop chasing that carrot and being the donkey behind it. But Lord, they want to be a child of God. Maybe today's the day where they say, I want to be saved. I want Jesus. Maybe today's the day where they turn back around and come back to Jesus because they were wayward in their past walk. And they want to be close to God once again, to that man, that woman here today. I'm here to tell you that God never moved but he will chase after you even when you stop coming after him. Maybe there's a man, a woman, a child, no matter the age, a family that wants to join this church today. And they want to be a part of this ministry. Lord, I pray they would come forward and be a part of this ministry of Barnwell First Baptist. 
be the hands and feet of the gospel as we go into a community and we share his word. Lord, I pray no matter what, we would be open to your call and your plea. Lord, there's not a person here today he's not calling to do something. Let us answer the call. Let us awaken our soul and our spirit and be a pleasing aroma into your names. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you.